If we're good to go, Explorers, we're going to go ahead and start the program. So uh, please continue to log in. Don't worry if you're not logged in yet. We're going to have practice questions throughout the show. But at the end of the program, pay attention because we will have a quiz today and we are going to have a winner. So I want you to pay real close attention throughout our virtual field trip. Also, uh, send in your questions early and often. I know some of you are already extremely active on the chat. And let's continue that activity over on the chat, okay? So it looks like we already have uh, lots of folks with us today. Star Wars shout outs from yesterday, awesome. Uh, Katie's with us, let's see, Gabby's with us. A lot of folks are with us. So let's go ahead and get started. I hope you're ready to go exploring and get out of the house. I am as well. So let's do it, explorers. All right, all right, all right. Welcome all explorers. You're now watching Learn Around the World's Geo Show. This is an interactive virtual field trip that takes you all around the world. We take you to unique places. We learn about new cultures, new peoples, new histories, and new natural wonders, just like today. And we come back and share these places with amazing students, parents, and teachers, just like yourselves, uh, in our homes nowadays and not in our classrooms, uh, but we're still having fun with it. And we hope that we can inspire you in some way to go out and learn more about these locations that we introduce you to. So I can, I'm not gonna tell you everything there is to know about the monarch butterfly. That would be impossible for anyone to do in such a short period of time, especially such a beloved insect like the monarch butterfly. However, uh, we hope we can inspire you to learn more about this amazing animal, or more about this amazing migration, and more about the cultures that are located around the overwintering sites. And that's where we're headed today on our vit virtual field trip. Hello, everyone. My name is Brandon. I'm going to be your guide on today's virtual field trip. You can call me Brandon, Mr. Brandon, or some kids even call me GOB because our show is called The Geo Show. And today's title of our program is The Magnificent Monarchs, brought to you by LearnAroundTheWorld.com. Uh, along with Connected North, bringing you amazing virtual experiences uh, during these times and during regular times as well, I know for a fact. All right, so we're kicking off today's show with our first survey question. So if you're already logged in, good for you. If you're not, uh, continue to do so. I'm going to throw that game pin up right here so you have it. Continue to get logged in, but you know what? We're jumping right into the deep end. Let's do it, Explorers. So I want to know first from you today. All right, so you have just a few seconds to answer. So this is our first practice one. Where does the monarch butterfly go during the winter time? We don't see them in the summer. Where do they go, Explorers? Do they go to California, Florida, Mexico, or all of these locations? What do you think? All right, so they do go to Mexico, but they also go to California. They also go to Florida, and some of the mon monarchs do not migrate at all. So we're going to learn all about this, but the best possible answer here is all of these locations. But most of them, most of the monarchs, the biggest populations do go to Mexico. So we're going to learn all about where they're going, where they're coming from, where they're coming back to right now, where they're at right now, all that and more on today's Geo Show. But we start off all of our programs, Explorers, talking about locations. We're a geography-based program. Uh, we use science and culture and all of this stuff wrapped up together to introduce you to locations. And that's what we really try to drive home today in all of our programs is we want you to learn about these locations, think about how they relate to your home location and what what are some of the similarities and differences and what may be some explanations? Speaking of locations, so we always start off acknowledging that we're coming to you live today from Portland, Maine. We're on the ancestral land of the Wabanaki people or people of the dawn. And that's where we're coming to today and where we're coming from 
with our uh, culture that we're bringing along with us. All right, so we're getting started today. Where are we headed today, Explorers? Well, we're headed south on today's virtual field trip to the country of Mexico. We're going to learn where most of the monarch butterflies go, and we're going to learn about the overwintering sites. Now, they go to a, just a very small location. We'll highlight an area here in central Mexico. This is up in the mountains called the Transvolcanic Belt. But if you look at each one of these little locations that I've marked here on our map with these actual monarch butterflies, these are the overwintering sites. And the overwintering sites in Mexico are located in the red state here. This is the state of Mexico. And in the orange state, this is the state of Michoacan. So the United States of Mexico, uh, just like the United States of America, are a collection of states, not provinces. And Mexico has 31 states and one federal district. So Mexico City is their capital city. That is their federal district. Now, most of the monarchs come to Michoacan. And this state is famous if you like avocados. Lots of the avocados that you find in your grocery stores will come from this Mexican state, uh, Michoacan. And this is where most of the monarch butterflies are going. Most of the overwintering sites are there. But a few of them, uh, monarchs don't recognize state lines or country lines for that matter. And, uh, and so th they are in both of these modern day states in Mexico. So when we zoom in a little bit closer here, why are they coming here to these mountains? Uh, well, it provides the perfect uh, temperature, the perfect level of humidity in the air uh, up in the transvolcanic belt. So that's this mountain range that runs east to west in central Mexico. And they are uh, overwintering in very large groups called colonies. So a large group of mutter butterflies is called a colony. And these colonies are overwintering, and it's called overwintering because they spend the winter, they're overwintering here, waiting for winter to be over. They're not really doing anything here, as we're going to learn today. They're not eating, they're not drinking, they're not mating during this time. They're just sitting in the trees, and we call this roosting. So what are they doing in the trees? Right, roosting. We're going to come back to this word. We're going to use it a lot today. So remember that word with me, roosting and colonies. So they're in colonies at, over, at each of these overwintering sites. And what are they doing there? They are roosting. Roosting in the trees is what they're doing. All right, so when we talk about other locations, like near all of your homes up in Canada, and where are they going? So when they disappear every summer, these monarch butterflies are heading south to Mexico. And as we learned in our first Kahoot question today, not all of them are going to Mexico. There is a Western population. So all of the Western monarchs west of the Rocky Mountains are going to go to California. And everything east of the Rocky Mountains, they are going to Mexico, and a big portion will go trickle into Florida. Uh, some of them will trickle into Florida, but most of them will get pushed into Mexico by the Gulf of Mexico and the Rocky Mountains. So it acts like a big funnel. So how are they going south? They use something called a sun compass. So they know as they fly south that the sun rises in the east, goes up in noontime and sets in the west. So they know if they keep the sun on this side of their body in the morning time and then keep the sun on this side of their body in the afternoon time, that's going to get them going south. And then they get funneled by the natural features of the Gulf of, Me Gulf of Mexico and the Rocky Mountains. But that's what all we know by science. We don't really know how they get from here to these overwintering sites, the same overwintering sites year after year. How do they do it? No one told them how to get here. There's no map that says go this way. There's no signs up for the monarch butterflies. And the last monarch butterflies that came here were their great, 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 great grandparents. So how do they do it? That's still a mystery to scientists is how they find these overwintering sites every single year. So today on our virtual field trip, we're going to walk around these overwintering sites and see what they're actually doing here. Now, they're not here right now. They've already started back north. So after spending all winter roosting in the trees, they, around spring, early spring, typically in uh, March, 
Uh, they're going to use about mid-March or so. Could be, depends on the weather. and But they're going to start flying north. Now, the same monarch that left your home, that left all of your homes last fall, lives nine whole months. It travels all the way down to Mexico, spends all winter, starts traveling north. Then they are going to lay their eggs. They're going to die. So each year, there's about six generations of monarch. So there's the migrating monarch that starts the journey north. They lay their eggs, they die. Now we have a new generation. We go egg, caterpillar, chrysalis, adult butterfly. So the children, next generation, fly north. Now these adults are on a different life cycle. They only live about two to six weeks. Same cycle happens again. They fly further north, two to six weeks. This happens five different times throughout the summer. So five generations, and then at the end of summer, we have that sixth generation, and that's the new migrating butterfly that's going all the way back to Mexico and spending all winter there the next year. So this is where we're headed today, explorers just west of Mexico City in the mountains, and let's get to it. All right, so as we just introduced to you the overwintering sites today, this is where we're headed. Now, we don't have time to go to all of these overwintering sites today, but what we are going to do is we are going to visit the overwintering site of Piedra Harada. Now, Piedra Harada is located in the bottom right hand of this blue box. So it's in the state of Mexico, and we're going to zoom right into it. And I want to show you a little bit uh, about this geography of these overwintering sites before we go walking around on the ground. So remember I said they uh, roost in the trees in a big group. Does anyone know what a big group of monarch butterflies is called? Do you remember what we called that? Anyone know in the chat box? Let me know. So we have a big group of monarch butterflies. All right, so Charlotte, right, big old virtual high five. So they're called a colony. So the colony, when you look at, remember these mountains are running east to west, and the colonies, uh, they roost on the south side of the mountains. So I drew in here, this is a ridge. So this line is the highest point of the mountain, and so we have the north side of the mountain and the south side. Does anyone have a guess? Anyone have a guess why the monarchs roost on the south side of the mountain and not the north side. Anyone have a guess there? Let me know if you think you know. All right, it, you're right, it is. Ashley, Charlotte, yeah, you're both great. It's warmer, it's warmer there. Now, follow up bonus question for 1 million points. Why is it warmer? Why is it warmer on the south side? The north side is cooler, you're right, you're right. So why is that? Anyone have a guess? Protection from warmer winds. Okay, so it could have something to do with the winds. It is something a little more, uh, a little more direct than that. Uh, okay, it has to do with the equator. Think about the equator. The equator is south right now. So what travels across the sky in the southern part of the sky when you live north of the equator. All right, the sun, great job. So right, it's the sun. Think about this, we do the same thing as monarch butterflies. Go around your home today, look around all of your homes. Most people that live north of the equator, you will have more windows on the south side of your home. Why is that? It's because that's where the sun is. You're letting more sunlight into your home. So your home is warmer, when you let in more sunlight. And the monarchs know this too. So it's actually warmer here on the south side of the mountains, whether if they went to the north side, they would be in the shade the whole day and it would be cooler over there. So they're on the south side of the mountains, over 10,000 feet in elevation. And this just provides for them the perfect habitat for them to overwinter. Remember, they're just not, they're not eating, they're not drinking, they're just waiting out winter. They're waiting for winter, and it's not a hibernation, so they're awake, but they're just roosting. They're just roosting there in the mountains. All right, so let's keep going here, explorers, and uh, let's go down and see what it's like on the mountainside at Piedra Harada. So we're gonna go down there and actually hike on the ground here today on our virtual field trip of the overwintering sites. So let's do it. All right, so just a few uh, visual proofs for everyone. Uh, when you look at the mountains here, not a lot of people 
realize this. You think about Mexico, you think about some a place that's hot, you think about uh, some desert type environments in northern Mexico. But once you get to central Mexico, because of the elevation, some of these mountains are over 12,000 feet in elevations, right? And there is snow there, Charlotte and Isaiah. Great observation. So a lot of people want to know what the uh, what life is like and some of the community life is like in the mountains. So as we're driving from Mexico City through the mountainside, you can see many of the communities. People are living uh, closer to the highway. There's farmland in the background. And notice these trees back here, Explorers. So this is the type of forest that we have here. So this is a... Uh, coniferous forests. So these are all coniferous trees. You may have heard of evergreen trees or things like pine trees, right? Pine trees are trees that drop cones. So for some of our older explorers out there, you may want to uh, hold on to that word up here, coniferous versus deciduous trees. So deciduous trees drop their leaves. Those coniferous trees, they drop cones and they keep their leaves all year round. Another characteristic of a coniferous tree is that they have soft wood. And so these trees do really well growing in the mountains and on the mountain tops because of that soft wood. So they can blow in the wind in those high winds that someone brought up earlier and their branches aren't gonna break because they have soft wood. They have branches that bend, not break. And that's gonna become important here in a couple of minutes, Explorers. But let's go ahead and introduce everyone to the uh, trailhead here at Piedra Harada. A couple of things I want to point out to you before we start hiking. Uh, we're at the trailhead and we're going to hike up to over 10,000 feet in elevation, but the trailhead here or at the parking lot, uh, we're around 9,000 feet in elevation. So we're about to hike up about 10,000 feet in elevation. When we look here, notice all these people that come here. So people come from all over the world and all over Mexico to see the monarch butterflies here in central Mexico. So that has a big impact in good and bad ways. So the environmental impacts of all these people coming here uh, is not so great, right? So how can we minimize those impacts? And we'll talk more about that as we start walking. Uh, but the other impact that we have here is an impact of money, right? So we call that an economic impact. So all these people coming from around the world and all over Mexico, they, they rent buses or get bus tickets. They uh, bring taxis or rent cars. They need a place to stay. So there's beds that they rent. Uh, they need to eat. So there's food they buy and you need to get into the park. So just off here is the gate to get into the park and you buy a ticket to get into the park. And that money helps protect the environment. They use that money to help manage this forest for the monarch butterflies. So how much does it cost today? Well, it costs to get in here if you are a young person. So most of you explorers out there today, if you want to come here, it's going to cost you, uh, it's going to cost you 20 or sorry 40 mexican pesos so 40 pesos and adults is going to cost you 60 pesos to get in today now right now in the world is not a great time to talk about money conversions because it's jumping all over the place daily but for the past year or so and i'm sorry i should have looked this up in uh in canadian dollars uh but i'm gonna go with us dollars because that's what i know without looking it up uh, is over the past year, 40 Mexican pesos or so uh, has been equal to, or 20 pesos, I should say, is equal to one U.S. dollar. So 40 Mexican pesos is roughly equal to two U.S. dollars, and 60 Mexican pesos is equal to roughly, if you do the math there, it's going to be three U.S. dollars. So today, kids, you're going to have to pay two U.S. dollars your parents are gonna pay three US dollars to enter into the park. And that money, again, is used to help protect the forest. All right, so we're getting some great uh, conversions for the Canadian dollar right in our chat box. That's amazing. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, look around here. And so what other things can we talk about spending money on? Uh, right here, people bring up coolers of food. So you can buy delicious food. Shout out to Mexican food. Anyone here like Mexican food? Do you have any Mexican restaurants near your home? If you don't, uh, you may have, uh, I recommend trying foods that you can get here like tamales, tortas, tacos, uh, 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 
Tacos are uh, probably uh, the most famous one people are used to. Uh, also, you can rent a horse today. So you don't have to walk up. You can actually rent a horse. And people bring their horses up here, and that's going to cost you about 200 Mexican pesos or 10 U.S. dollars. What do you want to do today, explorers? Do you want to walk up today, or would you like to ride a horse up? Choice is up to you. What do you think? <laughs> He's a Gabby wants to ride. ride. You want to ride? You know, I. It's very uh, interesting. No one ever chooses walk up. <laughs> all right. So good thing on a virtual field trip, we can all get on one horse. So let's all jump on the horse here, and we are going to ride the horse up. Now, some spots are quite steep and a little bit scary, but even though we chose to ride a horse up, we can't ride all the way up. We can only go about halfway up or almost about three fourths of the way up. So we're going to jump off of our horse now and we do have to walk the rest of the way. So we're going to jump off of our horses and join the rest of everyone on the ground. And as we go up, you see all these people here. And wow, that's a lot of people. Look at all these people going through the forest. So remember at the very beginning, I said there's two kinds of impacts uh, that people usually uh, calls when they come to a place like this. You may have experienced this maybe around some of your homes uh, as if you have people traveling to your home area. Uh, of course, people, uh, tourists, are going to bring in some money. So we want to uh, use that in the best way possible. How can uh, those tourists, how can we make it where they're benefiting our local communities? And the second thing is often, especially if you live in a more rural or natural area, you have a lot of beautiful natural resources like parks and uh, streams and forests. Well, what happens is people, when you go out there, you can't help but to have an impact just by walking on the ground. Even if you're the best possible environmental steward there, there is just by walking on the ground, we have an impact. You may have noticed this at a school or a park in your neighborhood uh, where sometimes the sidewalk goes and turns a corner where people cut the corner, even in grass. So just by walking on the ground, we compact the soil. If you're a big hiker, you've noticed this when you go out into the woods or maybe you've watched game trail where the deer pass through. Deer do this as well. You can actually kill trees and shrubs right next to that trail just by compacting the soil by walking over it. So a couple of things we can do whenever we go into a natural area. Uh, if you're not familiar, leave no trace is a great set of rules. And, uh, and if you're an outdoorsman, then you already probably know a lot of this stuff. But a lot of it is it's pretty simple, boiled down to uh, we want to take only pictures, right? So we don't want to take anything out of the forest. And we want to leave only footprints. So we are leaving an impact with our footprints, but we want to leave it at that. We don't want to leave anything that we brought into the forest with us. All right. So uh, enough of uh, about people. We came to see monarch butterflies. <gasps> what is that? All right. So that is a monarch butterfly right there, explorers. And we're going to go ahead and pause right here for just a second because I want to review a couple of things with you. One is we're at the site of Piedra Herada. We're in the state of Mexico, one of these overwintering sites. Now, we chose to ride a horse up, but you don't have to ride a horse up. You can walk up. Uh, some people want to know how long does it take to walk up or hike up? Well, I know we all hate this answer, but it depends, right? It depends because some of us are faster hikers than others. Some of us uh, like to take lots of pictures. So if you're stopping along the way and taking pictures of all the, the, the pretty flowers and trees and other wildlife that you see, then it's going to take you longer than if you hike straight up, right? But I would say anywhere that 1,000 feet from 9,000 to 10,000 feet from the parking lot probably going to take you somewhere between 45 minutes to maybe an hour and 15, hour and a half. It just depends how fast you are hiking on the way up. And there's that beautiful butterfly that we all know and love, the monarch butterfly. And the monarch butterfly is an orange butterfly. Now, it gets its nickname, the monarch butterfly, from Europeans that came over uh, to this part of the world. Now, Europeans came over. And there was one group of Europeans that named, nicknamed this butterfly after their monarch. Do you know which group of Europeans that it was? Whose monarch was this monarch butterfly gets his nickname from? 
and why is that? So there's a history to that, uh, why they call it the monarch butterfly. So here we go. That's our next question over on Kahoot. Whose monarch was it named after? Whose group of Europeans was it? The Spanish monarch, the French monarch, the English monarch, or the Italian monarch? So a monarch, by the way, is just another word for a king or a queen. So it's a non-gender specific word. So uh, right now, currently, the Queen Elizabeth II in England is the monarch of England, for example. So whose monarch was it named after? That is our next question over on Cahoots. Don't forget to get logged in if you are not. 562-732. Was it the Spanish, French, English, or Italian monarch? All right, so it was the English monarch. So if you said yellow, big old high five to you. But why? Why is that? Why would you name a butterfly or nickname a butterfly uh, if you're this group of people? It's just the name that stuck. Uh, well, this group of people were from England, and their monarch at the time was King William III, which was from the Netherlands. The Netherlands is actually a country right here, and the Netherlands, their country color is orange. If you like football or soccer, uh, called in the USA, uh, then if you watch, if you like women's football, last year the United States played Holland or the, or sorry, not Holland, the Netherlands. Holland is a place in the Netherlands. Anyways, uh, they played the Netherlands, and you may have noticed if you're a fan of soccer that during the World Cup that the Netherlands were wearing orange jerseys. That's their country color. And so Prince William was from the Netherlands, and he always kept that name, Prince of Orange. So when they saw this beautiful orange butterfly, those English people that came uh, to this part of the world, they nicknamed it the Monarch Butterfly. Of course, it's had many different names uh, by indigenous peoples all over uh, the Americas and, uh, and uh, had their own name for them, of course. So when we look at the Monarch Butterfly, uh, the common name today that stuck with it, uh, you can see that beautiful orange color that we all know and love as we walk around uh, the site here. Look up in the trees, look on the ground. There's monarchs all around and watch your step. Here we go. All right, so we're gonna see that beautiful butterfly and we're entering into the colony here. So remember, a colony is a big group of butterflies. You see them in the colony here. This is uh, filmed, this was filmed in March. So that means that they're getting ready for their journey back north. And some people are uh, curious or want to know, why are monarchs on the ground? Why do you see them on the ground like that? Why aren't they uh, up in the trees? Well, did you know that a monarch, it needs to be 60 degrees or warmer for them to fly. So if it's raining or if it is too cold, or if you're in the mountains where temperatures go up and down really quickly, depending if the sun is behind the clouds or not. So it could be a sunny day in over 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And then as the clouds come over and someone can uh, fact check me here, because I know you probably use Celsius. So uh, I just don't know Celsius off the top of my head. So if you, uh, it needs to be over 60 degrees Fahrenheit or what that temperature is in Celsius for them to fly. So if it's under that and they're on the ground, the sun goes behind the clouds, they need to wait for it to warm back up until they can fly back up into the trees. So you do have to watch your step there. All right, so as you look here off in the distance, does anyone know uh, what uh, is, something looks weird or kind of odd about this tree. Does anyone notice anything about this tree that looks kind of odd to them? Here, maybe I'll help you out. I'll draw some of the, highlight some of the limbs at the top of the tree. And then look at the bottom. Some of these limbs are going down like this. Anyone notice anything weird about that? Right, so, Gabby says snow. That's a great observation. This is why I bring it up. They're weighted down. They are weighted down. Yeah, and it's not snow, but what do you think is weighting them down? Right. A cocoon, well, not yet. So we have the adult butterflies here. So, right. So these are butterflies. So 
this is a great point. I'm glad you brought that up. Well, there's two things. Cocoons, monarch butterflies don't make cocoons. They make something called a chrysalis. That's one. Two, uh, so it's interesting when we talk about the cultural impact of the monarch butterfly into the people of Michoacan. People from Michoacan never see the other three stages. There's four life stages. There's the egg, there's the caterpillar, there's the chrysalis, not a cocoon, and then there's adult butterfly. So the adult butterfly flies down to Mexico over winters, waits for winter to pass and flies back north. So it never goes through the egg, caterpillar, and chrysalis stage here in central Mexico. So I'm glad you brought that up to, to talk about that. So it's the butterflies. Do you know how much a monarch butterfly weighs? About, a much, about as much as a small paper clip. Imagine how many paper clips you have to put on these tree branches to make them hang down that far. Explorers, that's a lot of butterflies. In fact, let's go over there closer and look at all of those clusters of butterflies on these limbs. So as you look up these big, big, dark clusters that you see with the light hitting them on the top of those clusters, those are all monarch butterflies, completely covered with monarch butterflies here at the overwintering sites. And it's not just the limbs explorers. And remember those softwood trees that we told you about in the beginning? That's why they're bending down so far like that. You may be familiar with snow where you come from in the winter time and see those pine trees bending down like that, weighted down with snow. And I'm glad you all brought that up. Uh, look at this tree right here. Do you see the bark of the tree? I can't, I can't even see the bark of the tree. It's completely covered with butterflies. Now, some people ask me, well, why, why, is, why aren't they orange? We just talked about them being orange and this monarch of uh, England that came from the Netherlands and all this stuff. Well. When they close their wings, they're actually, uh, they have more of a whitish shade, uh, darkest shade on the bottom of their wings. So that's why they keep their wings closed when they're roosting. Remember that word? Because they are uh, getting really close to each other. And the colder it gets, they'll actually roost closer to one another. It helps keep them warmer. Uh, but here in March, when it's starting to warm up, they'll fly around. Here's a great shot on the other underside of the monarch butterfly. Uh, and when they're roosting on the limbs, does anyone know, what are they holding on to the limbs with? How many legs does the monarch butterfly have? Does anyone know that? All right, so it is six, Charlotte and Isaiah. So five, right, it's six. It's six because they're an insect. So insects have six legs. And I bring that up because one of the cool things about the monarch butterfly is unlike some other butterflies, that they, have, um, they have scales on their wings. And a lot of butterflies are really delicate, meaning if you pick them up and hold them in your hands, you knock the scales off their wings and that can prevent them from being able to fly. The monarch butterfly, because they make this big long migration from as far away as near where all of you uh, live, sometimes over 3,000 miles all the way down to central Mexico. They're really tough, they're really durable. So they're a butterfly that you can actually pick up and hold and you're not gonna hurt. I mean, obviously you could hurt it, but if you're careful, you're not gonna hurt it just by being careful with it, like you can with some other butterflies. And that's why we all love them. But sometimes when you hold them, you notice when they're walking around on your hand or you see them on a flower or something like that, it looks like they're walking on four legs. And they are walking on four legs, but the front two legs, they do have six. They actually keep tucked in close to their body. So if you ever look at them and say, hey, they have four legs. Well, look a little bit closer. They actually have six legs. They are insects. So they have three body parts too. So uh, head, thorax, abdomen, six legs. Uh, because they are insects. So if you look at them here, it looks like they have four legs that they're holding on or roosting with, uh, but it's actually six. So we talked about lots of people that come here and their impacts. Look, it's hard to make your way through the forest. People are taking pictures, looking up in the trees for good reason. It is one of the most amazing things you'll ever see in your life with millions of monarch butterflies all around you and flying around. It is really amazing. But they're not the only people that come here, Explorers. So this is a great opportunity every year to collect some very important information for studying monarch butterflies, specifically 
how many monarch butterflies there are. Because if we track it every single year, we know if the population is going up or going down. So that gives us an indication of how well the monarch butterflies are doing in the wild. Because it's really, it would be really hard to count them in the summertime. They're spread all throughout Canada and the northern part of the United States. They're out all over the place and they're going out and laying their eggs and turning into caterpillars, going into a chrysalis, going into an adult butterfly, going into laying eggs, going into caterpillars. They're doing that all summer and they're doing that wherever you find what? Does anyone know what that super important plant is? That the, it's the only food that the caterpillar eats. Does anyone know what that is? Anyone have a guess? Right, milkweed, big old virtual high five there. So milkweed, 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 super important plant for the monarch butterfly because it's the only thing that the caterpillar eats. So when they lay their eggs, they lay their eggs on milkweed and that's the only food source of the caterpillar. Now the adult drinks nectar from any blooming flower, but the caterpillar has to have milkweed. So wherever milkweed grows, if you see milkweed popping up, well, soon there will be monarch butterflies not too far behind. Now I'm looking at showing you this picture right here because I want to use this as visual proof. You see there's no rain clouds in the forecast here. Now I'm about to turn the volume up. Uh, either unplug your headphones to do this or uh, watch the replay. Uh, but uh, often here on the Geo Show, we do something called deer ears. So I want you to cup your hands like you're scooping up water. And I want you to put these cups right behind your ears. And then I want you to point these deer ears towards the speaker where you hear my voice coming from right now. And you should hear me louder. And that's because bigger ears are better ears. We're giving ourselves a really good hearing adaptation right now because sound travels in waves and those big ears catch more sound waves. But I'm gonna crank up the volume and I want to let you listen to what it sounds like when thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of monarch butterflies start to fly around. Wow, they really did. They can black out the sky. There's so many monarchs here. Can you imagine one monarch? Obviously, you can't hear when it flies by outside. But can you imagine when thousands of monarch butterflies just start to fly around? It just sounds like rain or crackling sounds. Very cool. <laughs> Whoa, all right. So do we have any questions so far? Let me know in the chat box about monarchs. Just a couple of things to review. A group of monarchs is called a what? Who knows what they're called? What is a group called at each overwintering site? We call them a colony, great job. And what are they doing in the trees? What are they doing in these colonies? They are what? They are doing what in the trees? Are they dancing? Are they sleeping? Are they, right, roosting. Great job, roosting. So maybe they're sleeping, we don't know. Uh, inactive is a better word because did you know butterflies do not have eyelids? So can they sleep without closing their eyes? I don't know, it just depends how you define sleeping. The better term is inactive, uh, but we call it roosting, and that's what they're doing in the trees. Now look how many butterflies are right here. Now look at this, can you imagine, I said earlier, one of the big pieces of information they do or collect in Canada is how many butterflies there are. Can you climb a ladder and count all of these? One, two, three, hey, hey, I told you not to move, go back, one, two, three. Can you do that? No, of course you can't, that would be impossible. Uh, butterflies aren't going to stay in place for you. They're going to fly around, and uh, that would be dangerous to climb up and down trees just to count them, and it would be super hard. So how do they do that? Well, they make guesses, and they make educated guesses, but it's a guess. So we don't know the exact true amount of butterflies uh, that come to Mexico, but it doesn't matter. As long as we use the same method, we can tell if that number is going up or going down as long as we do it the exact same way. All right, so uh, again, if you have any questions, I would love to answer those about the overwintering sites. And as you're coming up with some questions, 
uh, since I just brought up the topic, I'll show you how we can count the monarch butterfly. Uh, first, one question that we often get is, how do you tell a girl from a boy monarch? Do you know how to tell a girl from a boy monarch? If we look at this monarch on the left and look at this monarch on the right, one of these monarchs is a boy, one of these is a boy, one of these is a girl, one of these is a girl or male, female. So which one is which? Here, let's uh, let's go with, let's say this one right here, this monarch. So let me know in the chat, what do you think? Is this a girl monarch or a boy monarch or male, female? What do you think? There is a way to tell the difference. I'll get out of your way and you can make your guess. I'll give you about five, four, three, two, one. All right. So we have some uh, girl guesses. We have some boy. We have male. The male is darker, you're saying. Uh, someone's saying it's a man. That is a man butterfly. Well, if you said boy, male, or man, you are correct. Big old high five goes out to you. So there are three different ways you can tell the difference. You can sex a monarch butterfly. One is, someone brought it up here, it's a darker color. So it's a little bit darker color orange, if you see the difference between the shades of orange. So this one is a male butterfly. Now, I can't personally, I, I have a really hard time with seeing uh, minute differences in color. So I don't rely on that. I, I tend to rely on two different methods. So the other is, look at the lines in the going through the wings. So these are, I call these pencil thin lines, or just think of thinner lines. Uh, and I think of these as Sharpie or magic marker lines is how I uh, keep track of it. Uh, but you can come up with your own method as well. But the number one quickest way for me is to look right here. Does everyone see these two black spots on the back of the male monarch butterfly? Do you see those on the female? No, you do not, right? And so that is a really quick way to tell the difference between the male and female monarch butterfly. So pop quiz, is this a male or female monarch butterfly? In five, four, three, two, one. Let me know, let me know, let me know, let me know. All right, girl, 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 girl. All right, all right, great job, great job. So you all got that one. Now you know how to tell the difference between a male and a female monarch when you see them. Okay, so our last survey question of the day is going to be, uh, do we have a healthy population of monarchs? Do we have a healthy population of monarchs? What do you think? So some of you were saying you could not see the whole thing. Uh, so here's what happens. Unfortunately, uh, you have to play with two windows. So I'm going to read them out so you know which color is what. Uh, but what happens is often when you go to a smaller window, a lot of these, uh, uh, the WebEx is going to cut off. It's going to change the ratio of the, the thing. So uh, so unfortunately, either you have to go full screen if you have two devices, or if you're playing with two windows, like I told you to do, I'm gonna read off the colors so you know which answer is which, okay? So listen carefully. So our next question coming at you is, do we have a healthy population of monarchs? Do we currently have a healthy population of Eastern monarch? And your answers are gonna be red, yes, blue, no, or yellow, I don't know. All right, so unfortunately, we went back to a blue no this year. We went back to a no, and it's been no for a really long time, but last year we did have a healthy population of monarchs. And how do we know all of this stuff? Well, remember, when we come to these overwintering sites, the, the monarchs are roosting in the trees. They roost together. They pack in really close uh, into colonies. And what we can do is we can take a measurement. We walk around. I say we as in the people living in Mexico, not me personally. But they walk around the edge of these colonies, and they mark all the trees around the edge. 
And so that's going to make a shape. Now we're going to use a circle because that's easier to think about today. Now, if you remember back in math class, we can take measurements of different things, right? So we can take a measurement of a straight line using centimeters, meters, kilometers, right? We can take measurements of the inside of a shape, the space inside of a shape, and that's called the area. So you can use different things like square kilometers, square meters to measure areas. But scientists to measure very large areas use a measurement called hectares. So one hectare equals roughly two and a half American football fields. If that gives you an idea about the size of one hectare. So stay with me here. So remember, this is an estimation. And what we're tracking here is remember, it's impossible to, to count all of them one by one. So instead, what we're doing is we're tracking the area. So all of these are measurements of hectares. So they go around to all of the overwintering sites. They walk around the colonies, flag it off. They, they shape out and take a measurement of that area. And then they add all of them together. And what you get is you get an overall number of hectares of roosting monarch butterflies. So starting in 1993, looking at the graph over the years, has the population been going up or down, Explorers? So overall, the population has been going down. Overall, the population has been going down. If you look right here in 2013, uh, a lot of people got extremely nervous that the monarch butterfly was going extinct uh, because look how low this number got. Uh, now, you can see we've had a, a nice little rebound uh, over the last few years. Last year, we had a great rebound, uh, but this year we went back down 50% of last year's number. Uh, and that can happen for several reasons. Uh, one is there's less uh, milkweed. Remember that very important plant? So the thing about humans, we've gotten really good at growing crops, uh, and especially places like in the Midwest of the United States and, and the uh, uh, farming areas of Canada. Uh, and But the, the bad side of that is a lot of times we use, um, uh, we, today all that milkweed that used to grow between the rows of our crops, well today uh, most modern uh, commercial farmers spray all of that land and they kill all, all of the milkweed. And so that's probably good for getting the most amount of vegetables out of the, the field. And not talking about is that toxic or not, we'll leave that aside. Uh, but who, the, who is that not good for? It's not good for the monarch butterfly and other animals that rely on milkweed. So uh, it's been a big push the last few years of getting people to plant butterfly gardens. And if you wanna help out the monarch butterfly specifically, Planning what? Planning what do you think? And it's planting that milkweed, I know that you're saying. So scientists have determined this is six hectares. So we need above six hectares of monarchs in Mexico to have a healthy population. And you can see we just got over that last year, but we went right back down. And this is just the Eastern monarch. The Western monarch in California is doing really bad. Uh, about they're about uh, over the last couple of years, uh, their numbers are down 80 to 90 percent uh, in California or at their overwintering sites. So the monarch, the Western monarch, is really not doing good. The Eastern monarch was really not doing well, and uh, we started to get a little bit of an improvement, a little bit of bump up. So hopefully, uh, scientists say we need that every year, not just one out of 13 years. We need that every single year. And part of that is growing milkweed and planting flowers that bloom in late summer because they don't eat all winter. They rely on their fat they build up on the way to Mexico to survive the winter time. All right, explorers, we're going to jump right into our geo quiz to see how well you were paying attention on today's geo show. So make sure you are logged in with that game pin. I'll get out of your way. It is 562732. Remember, uh, I will try to read out those uh, buttons for you that are playing on two windows and may miss part of the answers. Okay, so first question coming up, Explorers. I want to know, what is uh, the majority of the monarchs winter? Do you remember this from the beginning? The majority of the monarchs winter in which Mexican state? 
Is it the state of Mexico, the state of Chihuahua, the state of Hachul, or the state of Michoacan? So it's going to be red, state of Mexico, blue, state of Chihuahua, yellow, state of Hachul, or green, state of Michoacan. All right, great job, Explorers. Jumping out to the lead, we have Classy Owl. So most of them are overwintering in the state of Michoacan. About 80% of them or so go to Michoacan. The rest of them go to the state of Mexico. Uh, and next we have when, or sorry, do all monarchs go to Mexico? Red, yes, blue, no. Do all monarchs go to Mexico? Red, yes, blue, no. Right, no, so some of them go to Florida, some go to California, some don't go at all. Some of them don't migrate. So if you live in a place, if you're a monarch and you live where there's milkweed all year round, like the Gulf Coast of Louisiana or Alabama, Texas, or sorry, Texas or uh, Florida and the Southern United States, then you can stay there all year round. All right, so which one is, when do the monarchs leave Mexico? When do they go back north? When do they leave Mexico? Is it red in the winter, blue in the spring, yellow in the summer, or green in the fall? When do they leave Mexico? All right, it is the spring. So they migrate to Mexico in the fall and they spend the winter, that's why we call it overwinter, and then they come back in the springtime and then they spend the summertime spread all throughout Northern United States and throughout Canada, uh, going and uh, mating and laying their eggs on milkweed for those little caterpillars. All right, what do the monarchs do at the overwintering sites? What do they do at the overwintering sites? Is it red roost, blue dance, yellow sleep, or green eat? What are they doing at the overwintering sites? All right, they are roosting. Great job, I love it, I love it. And last one, a big group of monarch butterflies is called a. A big group of monarch butterflies is called a red herd, blue pod, yellow pride, or green colony. A big group of monarch butterflies is called a. All right, it is a colony, and today's winner is dun, 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 Classy Owl. Congratulations, Classy Owl. Big old virtual high five to you. You're going to get a postcard from me, G.O.B. from the Learn Around the World Studios. So you need to let Miss Katie or Miss Molly know who you are, Classy Owl. So send them a, or let us know in the chat box right now who you are, and they will follow up with you if either I can send them your postcard, or if it's okay with your parents, we can send it directly to your home, uh, whichever works best for you, your teachers, and your parents. All right, so uh, if you have any other questions about the Monarch, uh, I have time, I just don't know. I know we went, we started a little bit later, and went a little bit over, so uh, I'm available if it is okay with our facilitators or moderators. <laughs> oh, May, Kia. So um, maybe Kia, you can private message um, Katie with your address or me, it, either one, it's fine. And Brandon, I'll get, I'll, we'll figure out a way to get it to us. But I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, how many eggs does the monarch lay? They lay about 300 eggs at a time. 
And uh, yeah, and so we have, I'm giving you the condensed version. Uh, let's see, there's just so much wonderful things. We all love the monarch and I could sit here and talk for hours about them. Uh, but if we if we look at the life cycle, especially for our younger explorers out there, remember today I told you that uh, that I there's six generations of monarchs. So one of those generations every year. So the monarch that comes out of the chrysalis in late summer, usually August or September, they are going to migrate to Mexico. They're going to stop mating. But the other five generations of monarch before that are on a normal life cycle. So they are going to go around, they're going to fly around and lay 300 or so eggs on milkweed because as soon as that egg hatches after about uh, a couple of days, that little caterpillar that comes out is going to live for about two weeks and it's only going to eat milkweed. And how hungry are they? Very hungry. So they're only going to eat milkweed for about two weeks. Here's a cool fun fact about milkweed and monarchs. Did you know that monarchs are a poisonous butterfly? So they do not have a lot of predators as an adult butterfly. But here's the catch. Unlike other poisonous animals, they do not make their toxins. Their, their, their toxins that they have, they do not make them. So how do they get toxic? How do they become toxic? Does anyone know? Let me know in the chat. Oh, box. they might know this from Korean session. Charlotte and Isaiah said the milkweed, and Gabby says they eat it. Yeah, Smart so kids. The, right. So the milkweed is what's poisonous. The milkweed is a toxic plant. And so when they eat the milkweed, they keep, they retain that toxin inside of them. And they keep it in their exoskeleton. So an exoskeleton, uh, if we have any fans of Avengers out there, it's like Iron Man, right? So uh, when we have invertebrates, which are what insects are, they do not have a skeleton inside their bodies like mammals do, like we do. Uh, instead, they have a hard outside layer like Iron Man. And that's where they keep their toxins. So as an adult butterfly, they do not have many predators, except there are two birds that have adapted. There are two birds uh, that changed their behavior and they have figured out how to just split open the abdomen and only eat out the insides because those to toxins are in the outside, the exoskeleton, uh, and not on the inside where their organs are. Uh, but the caterpillar has lots of predators, uh, other insects, ants, uh, spiders, uh, less than 1% of those 300 eggs will ever become a butterfly. Most of them will be eaten as caterpillars. And those caterpillars, remember we said go into a chrysalis, not a cocoon, so a chrysalis, and they go into a chrysalis for about two weeks. And so this is really fun. If you've never done this before, this summer, when you see a caterpillar, if you find a caterpillar, take them inside, uh, you just have to bring in some fresh milkweed every couple of days uh, for about two weeks, and they're going to go into a chrysalis. And it's really fun to watch this process happen. Uh, and then out of the chrysalis, an adult butterfly will emerge. That's cool. Like that is that's a miracle. That's what we call a miracle. Uh, two questions from Charlotte and Isaiah. Um, why do the Mexi why or how do the Mexican colonies live longer than the other generations? Ooh, okay, so the, the the migrating monarch, right? So so here, let's let's look at it now. So where are they right now? This is a fantastic one of the cool things about monarchs is what makes them so fun is that they are like they are the poster. They are the they are the poster activity for citizen science. And if you don't know what citizen science is, uh, this is, these are things that you can do right at home, even during quarantine, right from your, your backyard or right out your window. When you see a monarch, you can go to journeynorth.com or .org, I think, journeynorth.org, and you, you put a sighting. Hey, I saw this monarch uh, today, what is it, uh, May 5th, you know, at, at my home in Canada. So you can see they're not in Canada yet. So the migration is happening as we speak. So right now they're just getting to the bottom of Lake Michigan. So they're going to be, they're on the way, they're on the way, but they're not there yet. Uh, so this is where they're at, but they're doing this in multiple generations. When they go south, 
It's one migrating butterfly, and it stopped. They just, we don't know why. They just stop laying eggs. They stop mating. And that one generation every year lives for nine whole months, not two weeks. It's fascinating when you think about it. So if we go back in time here, if we play it starting back in early March, you can see the migration happening. So every two weeks, when you put a when you log in your sighting over at journeynorth.org, it puts the a new color to the dot. So you'll see the dots turn from yellow to red. That's what you see here. But you can go back in years too. If we look at the migration from last year, 2019, we can play that migration, and you can see that migration going all the way up into Canada. Remember, they're following that milkweed. So you're not going to see monarchs until you see milkweed. So is milkweed growing up around your home yet? And if the answer is no, you're not going to see a monarch yet. So they're going to follow that milkweed on up. Wow, that's awesome. Like that is so cool. And so if the students do want to track them, they can go to journey. Journey, journeynorth.org. And you can track all that's kinds that. of things. They, they, they do other animals as well. And you can also track the milkweed. So if you're curious, where has the milkweed come? So this is last year's milkweed. Let's see where the milkweed has been sighted so far this year. So as you can see, the milkweed hasn't reached Canada yet. So if you see milkweed around your home, go to journeynorth.org. You can be the first one to log in milkweed. So as you can see, the, the caterpillars, or sorry, the butterflies are just behind the milkweed. They were here and the milkweed is here. So you can see they're not coming up here yet because they're following milkweed. That's the trick here. The milkweed is key. Uh, when they go south, there's another thing you can do. It's called monarchwatch.org, and you can order tags. And this has a deep history, Canadian history. So Fred and Nora Urquhart were scientists that noticed every year, Fred growing up in Canada noticed that the monarch left every summer and came back the following summer. And they wanted to know where they went. And they were the first scientists that really started citizen science. And they started tagging monarchs. And because you can tag them, because it's the same monarch making the entire 3,000 mile journey, you can tag them in California, or sorry, in California, in Canada. And if someone finds your monarch in, uh, in Mexico, it has a number on here. They report that monarch. And at the end of the year, you can go to their website and you can see if anyone found your monarch uh, along the way, or even in Mexico. So really cool, that program as well. But that's for the fall, for the migrating. Yeah, fall. and I will, I, I'll try and put those, I'll, I'll find those and put them on the website, um, our website, because I know C always likes them. Uh, uh, so two questions, sort of about the food. Does the poison in the milkweed hurt them? The, and which birds eat? The caterpillars. Okay, so it's a uh, it's an oriole and a grouse are the two species that have figured out how to eat them. Uh, and and so the milkweed that comes up. So this is what it's going to look like. So be on the lookout. Now milkweed, there's different varieties or different species of milkweed that grow across the continent. Uh, so if you want to know, uh, you can like your your school, your local school, or your local community. Uh, if you want to plant, say, a butterfly garden for the monarchs, uh, if you want to plant milkweed, there's organizations that will send you milkweed. You can probably go find milkweed if you live uh, in the countryside. Uh, you can, your local greenhouses uh, often or just will give that stuff away uh, because they don't want it. Uh, and as it comes up, this is what it looks like. And it's called milkweed because it has. Uh, it looks like milk when you break off the leaves, and it has a toxin in it. And so there are ways to prepare it. Um, I, I don't know how, but I do know there are ways to prepare it where uh, humans can eat milkweed. Do not try this unless you know how to do this. Uh, and uh, But there is ways you can do it. Insects, invertebrates don't seem to be affected by the toxins. So... Other insects as the, that eat the caterpillar, they, the caterpillars are like an easy snack. They're just available in lots of them. But once they become a butterfly, their primary, the only thing that would honestly catch a butterfly is a bird. And most birds are affected by this toxin. 
So most birds leave the monarch alone. And except those two birds, the Groose and the Oriole, that have figured out how to eat them. Pretty cool. And when we talk about being a poisonous animal, there's a really cool type of camouflage. Some snakes do this. You may know of this, any of our older explorers out there. But there's a form of camouflage called mimicry. Mimicry. So mimicry is when you mimic, you look like something else that is poisonous or that is venomous, but you are not yourself. And what you do, that's a form of camouflage to protect yourself. And there is a butterfly that looks like the monarch that is not poisonous, and it is the Viceroy butterfly. I'll see if I can bring up a picture for you. But the Viceroy butterfly is uh, a, it has a form of mimicry, and it is not actually poisonous itself. And you can tell the difference between the Viceroy and the monarch uh, here we go. Okay, does anyone see any differences here when we showed the monarch earlier? Look at the wing pattern. So here's a great one right here. Do you see this uh, perpendicular line that's running through here side to side? The monarch does not have that. So you can look at that one and right away you can tell uh, you see the line that's going across. Remember we pointed out where it took where I told you to tell the difference between the boys and the girls, the top part looks the same, but the bottom part, the monarch doesn't have this pattern like this. It doesn't have this line. So if you look at this line going back and forth, uh, you can tell that's not a monarch butterfly. And so, but it, it from afar, it looks like a monarch butterfly and that's called mimicry, that type of camouflage. Really cool. That is really cool. And we've learned so much about animal adaptations through Connected North at Home and from you, but I'm going to say goodbye to the explorers and Brandon now. We will be connecting again with Brandon to talk about Komodo dragons, ooh, which are really cool, and elephants and a lot of other things. So we're going to go on those expeditions with Brandon. And I want to thank all of you for coming today. We have two more sessions today. I know they love your sessions. Like, yay, Komodo dragons. Yeah, they're awesome. Um, we just love exploring with you. And we have two more sessions today. One is um, in a couple of hours with x-rays of mummies with Miss Allison, which is going to be really cool. And we have a new artist this afternoon with the Vancouver Art Gallery. Um, so just go to the website and thank you, Brandon. I'll contact you about the postcards and may please send me your email and see you guys later. See you soon. Bye explorers. Thanks so much for sharing um, and we'll see you later. Bye everyone. Bye. Have a great day. Bye.